Well, good evening. Welcome to the Bible Study Hour. I am Pastor Joel McGarvey. I am the President and Executive Director of Bible Doctrines to Live By, and we are so glad that you have joined with us tonight for the Bible Study Hour. And before we do anything else, as always, let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Our Father, we are thankful that we have this opportunity to come together tonight. And uh, Father, we pray that you will bless our time together that uh, you will be our teacher, your word will be our guide, and we'll allow you to teach us tonight. And uh, we'll be careful to give to you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. For it's in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Well, good evening, everybody. It is Sunday, and it's 5 o'clock, and that means it's time for the Bible study hour. And we are glad that you have tuned our way. Now, I, as I always do, um, actually it's uh, Wednesday, as we're recording this Wednesday afternoon, because I'm leaving town tomorrow, Thursday, and won't be back until Sunday evening. I will be speaking out in Wisconsin Sunday more Saturday, rather, and uh, then we will be back Sunday. So we had to do this. And uh, so, as I, am, as I am speaking to you, as Sunday night, as you're watching me Sunday night, Susan and I will be driving, and uh, hopefully getting near Grand Rapids, but uh, we will be driving. So, all right, so we're glad you've joined us, and uh, I don't know where you were Wednesday, but you weren't here, so I hope I caught up to you, or you've caught up to me, and uh, you're here on Wednesday with us. Let's just, uh, before we get in our study, let's go through our regular little commercial. I want to always keep any newcomers attuned as to who we are and what we do. At Bible Doctrines to Live By, we are uh, an evangelistic, a Bible teaching, a printing, a publishing, um, a Bible conference host and speaking. Uh, and uh, also now with several programs on the internet and other programs ready to come. And so uh, we are a multifaceted ministry uh, run by a very small staff. Right now, currently, we have Susan and I, and then there's uh, my daughter-in-law and her husband, Matt. As you didn't know, Matt is my son, my daughter, daughter. and my son-in-law, Matt, uh, and then there's Cindy. So there's five of us, and uh, we are here Monday through Thursday in the office from 8 till 3, and then uh, we are on the road a lot of weekends, mostly about six months of the year. Susan and I will be on the road and speaking and teaching and preaching and conducting vacation Bible schools, or as we call them, family Bible schools. And then we also have our list of Bible study materials, some of the things that we publish, uh, in a catalog. Uh, we have that available to you for, uh, for you. Uh, we have our Bible study materials, our gospel tracts, our graded curriculum, and I know that there's a brand new one about ready to be added, and we're not ready to announce it yet, but I, it's laying on Matt's desk, and it's, it's ready to come out and ready to be known, but uh, we're not quite there yet. So uh, we have yet another one in the younger ages uh, that is being, will be introduced very soon. And that's continuing to grow. I think, as I've said before, and I'm not bragging, I think we're meeting a real need, is we have the largest uh, curriculum, graded curriculum, that rightly divides the word of truth. And I know there are those who, well, what do you mean by rightly dividing? Because those, those, that term is, is almost gone uh, in our grace movement. Uh, but uh, we, are, we have the largest curriculum, span of curriculum from uh, first grade, kindergarten, first grade, all the way through uh, teens and into adults um, that's available. And uh, so if you would like some good, solid, rightly divided, mid-acts, dispensational Bible study teachings for your Sunday school to ground your young people in the Word of God and the Word rightly divided, we are here and we're here for you. Go to our catalog, see how much we actually have, and at a relatively reasonable price. 
when you purchase a Sunday school curriculum from us, you, ha you are also having the rights to, re uh, to copy, to make copies of it uh, in the future. We realize that it wears out if it's done right, and uh, we want you to have, have the original copy and uh, make copies for your teachers to use and keep that original so you can make more copies. Now, you can't sell it, um, but you can copy it for your use. And so we want you to be able to do that. So that's all there. And of course, we have a catalog with all of our materials available to you. There's the number you need to call. It's on the screen there, 616-785-3618. Call and ask for a catalog. We will send that to you. We update the catalog regularly. Also, our, our website is there with, with all of the material. You can see some of it has a little example, a sample with it. But all of that's available to you on the website. Uh, you can look at it. You can purchase it. And uh, we get that out uh, very rapidly and get that back to you. So that is there. Or you can just send us an email at staff at BibleDoctrines.org. And we will get a catalog to you right away. You send us an email with an order on it. That's fine. Or call your order in. Just have those numbers of the product available. And we can fill that order and get that off to you right away. But that's all there. Don't forget Tuesday night Bible time. We will be here Tuesday night for that live. And um, we have picked up our study once again that we had to drop off for the, for the summer as we were traveling uh, back to the unfolding of the word of truth. And so last week and this week, we are setting the stage to continue and really just sort of doing a review of where we left off so that we can catch, catch new people back up and bring them along. And then we'll be picking up again uh, with the unfolding of the word of truth. And so we'd invite you Tuesday night at 7 o'clock right here live on Facebook and YouTube. So that will be there. Uh, don't forget our morning program, Monday through Thursday. We have morning coffee with a bite of scripture. And that's at 930 each morning Eastern time. And uh, so if you're not sure of that, if you're in central time, that would be 8.30. And if you're in mountain time, I think that would be uh, 7.30. And if you're on the Pacific, it would be 6.30. And, uh, but uh, I think, I don't know if there's another one in there or not. But anyway, um, Tune in, and we have a, a, a bite of scripture, a little devotional, and then we have a time of prayer, and people share their prayer requests, and we have prayer, and it's just a good time to meet together as the body of Christ. And don't forget our coffee cups. You know, like I always say, everything tastes better in a Bible Doctrines mug, whether it be coffee, Diet Sprite, hot cocoa, whatever it is, tastes better in a Bible Doctrines mug. So those are $14 each or two for $24, and that includes the shipping. That includes the shipping. I'm not going to lie to you and say it's free shipping. It includes the shipping. Okay? So that is there. All right. <clears throat> last week, last week we began our study, uh, our look at uh, the idea of uh, because of Calvary. Because of Calvary. And, and we began by looking at, and we'll continue that today a little bit, but looking at that love of God. You know, we started with John 3.16, for God so loved. And that little word so gives to us the degree of his love, begins to give to us the degree of his love. Maybe, maybe we can't express that to its fullness, but for God so loved the world, that he gave. He gave his son. Romans chapter 4 tells us that his son was delivered for our offenses. That Jesus Christ, as 1 Timothy chapter 1 says, he came in the world to save sinners. The only way that was possible was for Christ to die. He would be the propitiation. He would be the atoning sacrifice. He would be the one that hit uh, God's standard of righteousness on our behalf. And he paid, he paid 
the debt of sin. Going all the way back to the beginning of time, all the way back to the beginning of time, with the fall of mankind, with the fall of Adam, the disobedience of God, uh, the disobedience of God by Adam, the blatant disobedience, God, Adam knew what God had said, and yet, and yet, uh, he caved and he ate the forbidden fruit. And because of that, sin and death passed upon all mankind, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. For as by one man, that's sin, you know, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin, so that uh, sin and death passed upon all mankind, for that all have sinned. And you know, if we get nothing else, we must understand, you must understand, that all of us are born under that penalty of sin. All of us are born under that penalty of sin. And it's, but we must also understand that God the Father gave his son, gave his son to pay the price of that sin, to bring redemption, to bring forgiveness, as we're going to see. All of that he gave to us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, and that's one thing that we really have to come to grips with in our life. I had to come to grips with it. Maybe you'd still need to come to grips with that. Is that as a sinner, I stand under the penalty of death. But God, but God has, has, has already died for my sin. He's already given that to me. That there's already a forgiveness out there. And all I need to do is claim it by believing by believing in what he did for me. Believing what he did for me, believing what he did for you. The fact that, that he demonstrated his love toward us, that unconditional love for God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 says that while we were uh, yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. And again, you may be watching tonight and you say, you're saying to yourself, God could never love me. No, no, he could never love me. I would offer you that, yes, he can love you. You know, we're going to start here tonight in Acts chapter 7. Now, we've been looking at that on Tuesday night, and we'll look some more at that on Tuesday nights. But in Acts chapter 7, we have the account of, of Stephen standing before uh, the religious leaders and the people of Israel. And, and he comes to them, and, 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 and they will condemn him. They will lie about him. They will condemn him, and they will take him out, and they will stone him. And in Acts chapter, uh, in Acts chapter 7 uh, and verse 58, we read this concerning him. And they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes, their coats, their clothing at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Well, now we're introduced to this guy named Saul. Well, who's Saul? Right now, that's all we know about him. He was there. Uh, he, was, he, he was there. He was watching it all happen. Uh, he was on board with all that was happening. And, and as those who who uh, cast the stones, they took their coats off, and, and, and here's Saul, who was holding their coats, holding their coats. And, and we go over to chapter 8, right down to the next chapter, 8, chapters 1 through 4, and there's Saul. Saul again. Saul was consenting unto his death. So we know Paul was going along with it. He was right on board with all of it, consenting unto his death. That's Stephen's death. And at that time, there was great persecution against the, the church. That's the assembly that was at Jerusalem. That's not the, the church, the body of Christ. That was that assembly, that kingdom assembly that was there at Jerusalem. There was a, a persecution against the church, which, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the, uh, the apostles. 
And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And Saul, now we're back to Saul again, and Saul made havoc of the church, that's that assembly there in Jerusalem, entering into every house and hailing men and women and committed them to prison. Committed them to prison. In other words, what we have to be is, here's this young man, Saul. And, and he's there in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. And, and while they're there, uh, they take Stephen out and they're going to persecute him. Remember, the religious leaders persecuted Christ. They, they wanted him out of the way. They, they, they didn't go along with that kingdom teaching, that kingdom gospel. They, they wanted to get rid of him. He, he was a liar. He was a, a false one. And so they took him out and they crucified him. And having crucified him now, they've turned their sights on uh, others of his following, those who had gone along with him. And along came Stephen. And, and uh, so Stephen is one of those leaders in that assembly. And so they've taken Stephen. And Stephen, beginning in chapter 7, gives this long message of, of Israel's continued rebellion against God. And of course, that angers uh, the religious leaders because you see, they're the ones that are right. They're the ones that are holy. It's these other people that are, that are dragging away. They're, they're teaching false doctrine. And, and so they're after Stephen as well now. So they take and they arrest Stephen and then they, they persecute him and they, they stone him to death. And there's Saul of Tarsus right in on the, uh, right on in it with them. And he's holding their coats. Now he's leading this, this campaign against the, the believers there in Jerusalem. And he makes havoc, makes havoc of the church, uh, entering into every house and hailing men and women, hailing men and women. Now just continue on. Look at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters of Damascus or letters to Damascus. Now those letters are what we might refer to as uh, arrest warrants uh, to take. He was going to take them and he was going to go to, to, the to, to Damascus to the synagogue there and it says that if he found any of this way now, when I read that passage, I read that to mean that he's going to go to the synagogue in, Jeru in Damascus and he's going to, it, the synagogue will be full of, of Jewish people at synagogue. But, but apparently, there's two groups of Jewish people. There will be those who are Jews by birth and, and, not, not Jews, and Jews by religion, but not Jews by faith. Not Jews who have truly trusted in that Messiah, accepted their Messiah. And they are part of this way or the way. And, and that term, the way or this way, refers back to Christ and that messianic hope and that kingdom gospel and those followers of Jesus according to that way, the way of Christ, the way of, the way of hope. And, and uh, so if any are found of this way, whether they would be men or women, he might bring them bound back to Jerusalem. And so here's Saul of Tarsus, and he's not a good guy. Now he is a religious man, but he's not a good guy. And he's, he's leading this charge uh, against, against those who would be followers of Christ, followers of Jesus of Nazareth, and, and followers of that way. And, but look over at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look what it says there. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I will be there. There we go. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse, 13, or verse 15. Well, verse 14. That all, it all goes together. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. So we're talking about the love, the grace and the love of God uh, that was in Christ. 
That this is a faithful saying. This is a fa- this is a true statement. There's no doubt about this. He says, "This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation." Listen, you better your ears better perk up and you better be ready to receive and accept what I'm about to tell you. That's that's really what he's saying here. This is a faithful statement and worthy of all acceptation. Listen, that Jesus Christ came into the world to do what? Save sinners. To save sinners. To save sinners. And then what does he say? Of whom I am chief. Of whom I am chief. The Apostle Paul looked at himself, well, at this taste, by this time he's the Apostle Paul, but he looked at himself, Saul of Tarsus, leading that havoc against the assembly, leading that havoc against that kingdom church, bringing people in, people who would be, who would be killed, he would be persecuted, people who would be stoned. He's bringing these people in. Why? Why? Because they were followers of Jesus of Nazareth, because they were followers of the very Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. And his attack, his his whole mode of operation is against the Messiah. It's against that kingdom program. It's against God. In reality, it's against that anointed one. And yet, and yet, he says here that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy. What's the cause? What is the cause? The cause is is the fact that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Not only did he come into the world to save sinners, but Paul says, but Paul says uh, as Saul of Tarsus, I was the worst of all sinners. I was the worst of all sinners. That degree. That degree of my sin outweighed anybody else because my sin was against God. My sin was against the Messiah. My sin was against the Savior. I was campaigning against him. It wasn't my neighbor. It wasn't somebody else. I wasn't, you know, just killing anybody. I was out against God. And because of that, Saul, Paul, elevated his sin far above anybody else's. I was the chief of sinners. He's not talking about he was the first sinner. No, this is not, this is not a, a, an order of time. Who was the first sinner? Well, that would be Adam. That would be Adam. And if you wanted to include the angels, that would be Satan himself. But humanly speaking, it would have been Adam. Adam was the first sinner, for as by one man sin entered into the earth, into the world. That's Adam, and here Paul says, "I am the I am chief, and for this cause, in this cause, I obtained mercy. 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 Mercy is not getting what you deserve. That in me first, me first now." That word first there is the same word, protos, as you have in verse 15 as chief. And and when you have these words used in a continuing thought, in a continuing phrase, they mean the same, they're they're equal, they're they're, uh, defined the same way. And so over here we have the word chief, which is first. Which is first. And, and what he's saying, I'm not the first sinner, I'm the greatest of all sinners. And, and he's saying to me, now he says in verse 2, that in me first, in the, in the greatest of all ways, then the greatest of all ways, Jesus might show forth, mercy, uh, uh, forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. To life everlasting. Saul of Tarsus received 
mercy from God. Mercy, he received what he did not deserve, and he received it in a very large way. A very large way. So that Saul's life could be an example. Saul's life could be an example to all who would come after him. All that would come after him. And you know, I think you could you could you could make the example here or the application here that that God chose to save Saul the way he chose to save Saul, so that everybody would know, listen, if 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 I can save Saul, I can save you. I can save you. If I can if I can save the chief of all sinners, there's that example. Of, of, the, of, the, of the greatness of, of my salvation, the greatness of my mercy, the greatness of my grace. If my grace and mercy can be extended to the chiefest of all sinners, then as that example is there, that in, in that great way, Saul of Tarsus could be saved, then, then I can save you as well. I can save you as well. You know, and people say, well, I, I, I'm not a sinner. I, I, I've, never, I've never killed anybody. I've never robbed a bank. No. But, but sin is defined. We all bear. We all bear the mark of sin. We all bear that uh, on, from Adam. And, 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 and that manifests itself in many ways, some large ways, some very minor ways. You know, you can tell a, a lie. Well, but it's just a little lie. But, you know, the Bible doesn't say, don't tell, don't, thou shalt not tell big lies. It just says, thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not lie. Well, I never rob a bank, but, you know, I've, you know, cheated on my taxes once or twice. You know, we're all, we're all born with the propensity to sin in one way or another. And some people are, are mass murderers. But if, if God can save Saul of Tarsus, he can save the mass murderer too. And I guess what you need to see tonight is, is how bad you might think you are. God's love is still extended towards you. God's mercy and God's grace is still extended towards you. And if nothing else, we see that in the life and the example of the Apostle Paul, of Saul of Tarsus. If God could save Saul of Tarsus, he can save you. If God's mercy could be extended to Saul of Tarsus, his mercy can be extended to you. If his grace was given to Saul of Tarsus, grace, getting something now that you don't deserve. Mercy was not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Surely of all peoples, the, uh, that Saul of Tarsus did not, did not deserve mercy, did not deserve uh, grace. And yet, he got mercy and he got grace. Why? Why? Because of God's love. Because of God's love demonstrated toward us on Calvary's cross. Demonstrated toward us on Calvary's cross. Go over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Look how, look how this is so beautifully expressed here. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, where it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. God so loved the world Christ so loved the church that he gave his only begotten son, that he gave himself for it. 
Christ's love, Christ's agape love is so strong for you tonight, so strong for the body of Christ tonight. And that's who we're dealing with. That's who Paul's writing to here. God's love is so strong uh, for you tonight that Jesus Christ gave himself. He willingly surrendered his life for me and for you. Is that, it, that's, that's a beautiful picture of true love of true love. Calvary's cross is truly the love of God, the love of Christ in action. But but what ought to be the result? What ought to be the result? What should it mean to have now Christ in you? Christ in you. You know, in chapter 5 and verse 2, well, verse 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God, and that word followers means imitators. Be ye followers of God as dear children, as dear children of God. You know, when we come to Christ, we read last week Ephesians 1, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? The moment you put your faith and your trust in that finished work of Christ on your behalf, the fact that he died for your sins, he gave himself and died for your sins, he was buried, that sin was removed, and then he was raised again for your justification. He was raised for your justification. You stand justified before God. We'll look at that passage in, in just a moment. While we're here, let's stay here, and then we'll go over to 2 Corinthians, uh, or Romans chapter 3. But look here. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in what? Love. Again, agape love. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. As we come to Christ, all because of Calvary, because of what Calvary accomplished on our behalf for us, as we come to Christ, as we put our faith and trust in Christ, and then Christ, we are put into Christ, and then we have Christ in us, we have the Spirit of God dwelling within us, then we are, to, we are now to walk in love. We are to um, order our lives in a spirit of love one toward another. One toward another. Oh, yes, there's a love of God, but down, now there's a love for one another. We are to our walk, and that's the way we live, that's, that's what we're, how we, we carry out our life each day. We ought to be carrying out our life in an attitude or spirit of love one for another. You know, it's very easy sometimes. Um, well, let's go to Philippians, or let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 first. Then we'll go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice what it says. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, be in Christ, that this is a person who now has put their faith and trust in Christ. They are a, they are a, new, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God, now this takes us back to the cross 
and we see the love of God and the love of Christ. The love was that, that, that God was in Christ reconciling the world, the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by, uh, by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye now reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we, now listen, we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. You see, when, when we come to Christ, because of Calvary, because of God's love for us, because of the fact that Christ died for us, and now Christ lives within us, and, and we're in Christ. Because of that relationship, we now live toward others because we have that, that righteousness of God resting on us. And, and, and like I started to say before, there can't be any room where now it's all about me and, and, and you need to, you, need to you know, shape up and do it my way. No, look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we looked at this uh, as we went through the book of Philippians, but look at uh, Philippians chapter 2. Verse 1. Remember, Paul was struggling or dealing with, not struggling with, dealing with a little bit of contention within the church, the, the Philippian church. It looks like there's a spirit of jealousy uh, there, uh, a spirit of superiority there, uh, a failure to work together there. Um, uh, maybe just basically some began to think of themselves more highly than they ought. And Paul says, if there be any consolation in Christ, in Christ, if there's any, uh, if, if we're going to find any comfort any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, you notice what it is there. Everything there is, is, is a positive thing. All of that is the expression of love and grace uh, in our lives. He says, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, like-minded. In other words, get over yourself. Get over yourself. There's too much of that in the church. There's too much of that in the church today. There's too much uh, self-centeredness. There's too much, it's all about me. There's too much of my way is the right way, or my way or the highway. There's too much of that. There's, there's not enough of, of co-laboring, of, of working together in the church. And I'll tell you, what it does is it destroys. It destroys the church. It destroys the testimony of, of that church. And it destroys the testimony of Jesus Christ. But he says, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. Listen, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Having the same love. What's that love? That's agape love. You see, agape love isn't I'll love you if. Agape love is I love you. It's just I love you. having the same love, being of one accord, being of one mind. That's speaking of unity. That's where, that's where the love, when we have the love in our, in our minds, in our hearts, in our, in our life, when we're, our life is governed by that love of God in us, that love demonstrated toward us at Calvary's cross, when, that, when we have our life, when that, that is in our life and our life is reflecting that, is reflecting that. Then he says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. 
strife. You know, I'm on this committee to, to get red carpet, and by George, we're going to get red carpet. And, and, and strife, strife, strife tears apart. Paul wrote to the church of, of Corinth about the, he, there should be no schism in the church. Come together in love. Now, I understand that sometimes that churches will have differences of opinion. I understand sometimes churches will divide. But I've always said there's only really one reason to divide, and that's over doctrine. That's over the, the application of the word of God. Not because I like red and you like blue. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Now listen, let each esteem others better than themselves. You know the problem we have in the church today? Or one of the problems we have in the church today? is we've allowed the world, we've allowed a humanistic world view to become our view. We've allowed humanism to become the norm. And we've adopted the world view We've spent too much time listening to Oprah, and we've spent too much time listening to these psychologists and Dr. Phil and, and so many of these. Guys. We've spent so much time listening to these guys, and, and, and we need to take care of number one. We need to take care of number one. I remember years ago, years ago, I had a, a family having some difficulty, and, and uh, there was some issues there, and... and um, I suggested that the, the, the wife, uh, who, who wasn't the source of the, the problem, but she was dealing with a lot of, uh, there was sexual sin, there was perversion, there was other things going on, and, and I suggested that, that she perhaps uh, get some professional help, and she was admitted to a clinic, and that she was there, and it ruined her life. And I said I'd never do that again. Because even though they were Christian in their psychiatry, psychology, even though they were, they were, I'll tell you what they were. They were psychologists who happened to be, I think, Christian. And I said, I said I'd never do that again. It ruined her. She came out of there, and she really had less time for her kids, less time for her husband, less time for everything, because now it's all about me. I need to take care of me. It's all about me. It's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. And that family was torn apart. Torn apart. It's not all about you. It's not all about me. It's all about him. And when we set aside that, that attitude, it's all about me in the church. When we can, when we can get rid of the world's teachings, which is, which is Satan, when we can get rid of that, and allow the word of God to teach us and understand his love. His love is unconditional. It is that love that is to be flowing through us. It is that love that took him to Calvary's cross. And it's because of Calvary's cross that we can have that love in our own lives, in our own dealings. When we come to grips with that in our life, then our life begins to have meaning and our life begins to have, uh, we begin to have better relationships in the church. And the church will prosper. And yes, I believe it will even grow. But I'll tell you, nothing, nothing, nothing grows a church faster <laughs> than people fighting in the church. You know, visitors come in and they see people upset and they see people angry and they see people are. Oh, boy, that just says, let's come back here. These are my kind of people. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I read a little thing, I believe it was this morning. A fellow went to his pastor and he said, I'm leaving the church. Well, why? Well, because the 
this person's doing this, and this person's doing this, and this person's doing that, and, and this one's doing that, and this person's doing that, and, and that. And, and uh, the pastor said, would you do me a favor? And he says, what? He says, I want you to take a, a full glass of water, and I want you to walk around the auditorium, and I don't want you to drop, spill one drop. I want you to fill it clear to the top, but you can't, you can't drop one drop. And the guy went around, and he came back. The pastor said, did you drop anything? No, he said, I was concentrating, concentrating on that glass of water. And the pastor said, you didn't see that person over there cheating? Or you didn't see that person over there talking? And No, I didn't see. I was concentrating on this water. And the pastor said, you see, you're concentrating on the wrong thing when you're in church. You're supposed to be concentrating on the Lord, concentrating on the word of God, not that person sitting on the other side of the auditorium. Let God deal with that. Let God deal with that. Not you. You need to have his love. You need to have his love. And he says here, walk in love. And then he says, as Christ also hath loved us. We're to love others the way Christ has loved us. And the greatest demonstration of that is Calvary's cross. Calvary's cross. Because of Calvary, we see the love of Christ demonstrated to us. And therefore, we are to walk in love. And that walk, that word walk there is actually in the imperative, which means that's a command of God. That's a command. That's not a suggestion. It's not walk in love if you feel like it. Well, I don't want to. Well, if you're not willing to walk in love, then you're no better than the, per the, other, the other guy. If you're not willing to take God at his word and, and, and God says, I want you to walk in love, well, not if I don't want to. Not if I don't feel like it. Well, then you're just as guilty before God as the other guy is. It isn't if I feel like it. When we see those commands of God, it's, it's do it. Do it. Go over at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 12. He says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, and that's talking about the, as the body of Christ. That's a corporate phrase there or, or condition there. Holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness. Oh, where am I at? That's not what I want. I want 1 Thessalonians 3. Although that was a good one. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. So Paul is using the example of his love toward them, his self-sacrificing love for them. Remember, Paul is the one who was, who was persecuted, beaten. And yet he continued on, thrown in prison, and yet he continued on. Even in prison, he continued on to the task that God had given him. And he says here, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. I would take that to mean that they, had, they hadn't arrived. They hadn't arrived, and I don't think any of us have arrived. Therefore, we need to increase in that. We need to continue to press more and more and more toward more and more love one toward the other. Wouldn't it be something if we could build up as much as we tear down? 
or build up more than we tear down? Go back to Colossians 3 where I was. Colossians 3, verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. And we start with the premise that Christ in you, Christ in you. In verse 3 of that same chapter, he says, Christ who is our life, who is our life. So verse 12 starts by put on, put on. You know, in, in Ephesians and Colossians especially, Paul will spend a lot of time bringing order to our lives. And he uses several ways, several phrases, but he uses put on and put off. Put on and put off. And they're given, in the, again, in that imperative mood. They're commands of God. Commands of God. I, I look at the put-ons and put-offs of Paul, and, and people say, you know, when a preacher starts talking about not doing this and not doing that and not doing that, now I know in the context, the context of how it's delivered is important. But so very often, we've stopped preaching put-on and put-off because we will be labeled as legalists, legalists. Well, if teaching thou shalt not or you ought to stop doing this is just legalism, then Paul was a legalist. Paul was a legalist. And we would do well to join him in those ranks. Like I said, how is it presented? If, if it's presented that I, can stop, I should stop doing this and stop doing this and stop doing this and stop doing this so that I can have a better standing before God, that's legalism. That is legalism. I can't improve my stand before God. I stand before God righteous. I stand before God holy and blameless before him in love. That's mine in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. And Paul doesn't do that. Paul doesn't preach that so that we improve our standing before God, but he does do that so that we can pr improve our standing with one another and with the world outside. That we, we, we are now different from them. We act different from them. We think different from them. When we, we, we stop the bickering and the strife. We, we have a better relationship with those within the body of Christ. Um, and, and we stop the bickering. We stop the fighting. We stop this, all this stuff. It's all about me. We stop all of that stuff. We put all of that kind of stuff off. And we put on love. And he says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. When Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, he forgave you. He forgave me. And he doesn't hold a grudge. And you know what? He forgave you before you ever even thought of an apology. Oh, but we, we, we know better. We know better. Yeah, yeah. I'll forgive you as soon as you admit that I was right in the first place. See, that's what an apology is. That's what an apology is. Oh, wait a minute. I do believe in apology. I believe when I do something wrong before God, I need to apologize. I need to tell him, you know, I'm sorry. But I don't need to apologize so that he'll forgive me. That's already been done. I need to apologize 
and, 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 and have my attitude towards him changed. I'm sorry I grieved you. I'm sorry I've done this. I apologize. I was wrong to do that. But I don't do that so he'll forgive me. He's already done that. He loves me. And I can apologize on a horizontal way as well. I can apologize when I've done, I've done something wrong. I can apologize for that. Someone can apologize for me when they've wronged me. I can, they can do that. But when I have the attitude is, I won't forgive you unless you humble yourself before me and tell me I was right and apologize. That's wrong. Because that's not the example of Christ. That's not the example of Christ in you. That's a selfish, self-centered attitude. And it has no place in the body of Christ. Not when we're esteeming others better than ourselves. Not when we're forbearing one another, forgiving one another, our long-suffering towards one another. All of that is because of what Christ did on Calvary's cross. The love that he demonstrated for us at Calvary's cross ought to abound in us, ought to flow out from us in Christ Jesus. As Christ loved others, we, as Christ loved us, we are to love others. As he demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. Then he says, I want you to live for me. And I want you to demonstrate that love I have for you. I want you to demonstrate that to others. I want others to see me living in you. Where are you tonight? Where are you tonight? There's, there's, there's so much more I want to I wanna look at. I want to move on because of Calvary. Next week we're going to go to Galatians chapter 5. But I want, to, I want to close, in these last two minutes that I have left here, I want to close, and I want to say to you tonight, if you've, if you've been here the whole time, I want you to know that God does love you. In spite of who you are, in spite of what you've done, God still loves you. And he's, he's offering to you his grace and his mercy tonight. And he's able to do that because of Calvary. Because of the work of his son on Calvary's cross. The fact that his son took your sin and paid the price of that sin on Calvary's cross. Paid it in full. And he offers to you now a gift of life. Eternal life. By simply putting your faith and your trust in his finished work, his death, burial, and resurrection, believing that Jesus Christ died for your sin, that he paid the price of your sin, that that sin was buried, that sin was taken away, that when he rose again victorious over sin, death, and the grave, he rose again for your justification. You can stand justified before God. And that can be yours tonight by simple faith and trust in Jesus Christ, by just simply making that decision to trust Christ. It isn't making him Lord of your life. It isn't uh, praying a prayer. It isn't going to an altar call. It isn't getting baptized. None of that will save you. None of that will save you. We're not saved by what we do, our works. We're saved by what he did and our faith and our trust in that. And I would invite you right now, right now, wherever you are, wherever you are watching me right now, that you make that decision right now in your mind, I'm going to trust Christ. I'm going to put my faith and my trust in that finished work of Christ on Calvary's cross. I believe tonight that Christ died for me. And friend, when you take that, just that simple step of faith, 
you pass from death unto life. Well, we're out of time, but before we go, I want to share with you what I, I have for you. If you've made that decision tonight, I want to share with you this packet of books and booklets. I want, first of all, I'm going to give you a Bible, and I'm going to put that up on the screen. You'll be able to see what it is. It's right there. I'm going to give you a Bible. Then I'm going to give you this booklet entitled Beginning Your New Life in Christ. Then I'm going to give you a booklet entitled Saved by the Grace of God. You can see it there. Then I'm going to give you a booklet called For God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Has. It's done. He's forgiven you. And then I'm going to give you a booklet, Study, How to Study the Word of Truth. And I want that, I'm going to give that to you all free, all totally free, absolutely, positively free of charge. There is no, no hidden bill, no hidden cost. Everything's totally free of charge to you. All you need to do is write to that address on the screen and just say, I've made that decision to trust Christ. And give us your name and your address, and that packet will be in the mail to you right away. And, and, and we're not going to beg you for money. We're not going to sell your address to somebody else. If you want to contact us again, you can. But we want you to have that packet tonight. And we want to give it to you totally free of charge. Or you can call that number, 616-785-3618, and just say, I've made a decision for Christ. Give us your name and address, and we'll send you that packet. We'll send you that packet right away. Well, we're glad that you've joined with us tonight. And uh, I trust that uh, the program has been a blessing to you. Also, if you are a viewer, a regular viewer of the program, and you would like to help us with the finances involved with, with putting on a program like this and others to come, just write to that address and send us your tax-deductible gift. Just mark it to the broadcast fund, and 100% of that will go into that broadcast fund. I, I, staff, we receive not a penny of that. It all goes into just making the broadcast possible. So thank you for joining us. Have a good week, and we'll see you back here uh, Monday morning. We'll see you back here Tuesday night. Until then, have a great week, and as always, keep looking up. Good night, everybody.